Good evening. I'm Carol Olson Day of the New York Times, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this exciting Times Talks with three of today's most compelling collaborators in film. We're extremely thrilled to have as our guests three impressive film talents that you are not going to see just anywhere else. One is an Academy Award-winning director and producer with a distinguished body of work that has won him worldwide acclaim and a reputation as the very best in his craft. One is a film, television, and theater actress and a talented singer-songwriter, well known to Broadway audiences as well as TV and film fans. And our third guest is a celebrated actor, director, producer with many films to his credit, including a current box office hit tonight's film that we're going to be talking about, and two more movies to come later this year. These three accomplished filmmakers collaborated on the movie Killer Joe, the second work together by the director and Pulitzer Prize and Tony Award winning author Tracy Letts. You'll meet them and hear more about the film from our moderator. Every Monday, our moderator's media equation column is must reading for everyone concerned with how media intersects with culture, business, and society. He also writes extensively about film, television, and books for the arts section of the New York Times. He's also the author of the compelling memoir, The Night of the Gun, and you may recognize him playing himself in page one, a year inside the New York Times. Please join me in welcoming David Carr and our special guests, Gina Gershon, Matthew McConaughey, and William Friedkin. That's it here? Hello. 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 Oh, yeah. Good evening. How are you guys? Hi. Are we excited or what? <laughs> okay, who here has like seen a preview of Killer Joe? Has anybody seen the actual movie? Yay. Lucky you. Opens on Friday in Manhattan. And Killer Joe? Really killer. I mean, it's a great, great film. It's, uh, well, I'll mess it up if I explain it. Mr. Friedkin, could you just tell our friends in the audience what the film is about? About an hour and 40 minutes. Thank you very much. <laughs> the rest is up to them. Right. Because I try never to tell anybody what the films I've directed are about. OK. You know, I really leave that to them. The, the <coughs> crudest uh, telling of the story is it's about a Dallas detective, played by Mr. McConaughey, who also happens to be a hired killer. And a family, uh, a father and son, and the stepmother, played by Gina Gershon, uh, hire him to kill the ex-wife and mother of these two children for her insurance policy. Now, that's the story. And it, 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 like anything bare bones, you know, you'd say, oh, so what? But if I told you uh, that I was going to do a story about uh, a guy who was going to kill his uncle because he thought his uncle murdered his father, and he heard that from a ghost on the roof of the palace in Denmark, you'd say, who wants to see that? <laughs> but, but I tell you, if it's Hamlet, you know, you might be a little more interested. So it isn't the story, it's the characters and the interaction. And it was written by Tracy Letts. <coughs> And I'll bet you many of you have seen <coughs> August Osage County that he wrote. H how many of you seen that? <laughs> we should have had him here today. He, he won a Pulitzer for that, right? He won a yeah. Pulitzer for that. And, and he also wrote Bug. Bug. Which you made into a movie. Right. And Killer Joe. Right. He's a, he's a great voice in English-speaking English drama. One of the best writers around. Matthew, the, um, not that long ago in the New York Times, Dennis Lim wrote this really great story about you sort of 
you know, being on the A-list of the rom-com guys and how everyone wants you to come and uh, brighten up their movie and brighten up their lives, and the ladies seem to like you. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> um, uh, maybe it's because you take off your shirt occasionally. I'm not sure, but... Um, <laughs> But so you're this, the, the, you're, you're just the picture of Suave in these rom-coms, and you, you, you bring a certain calm to it, and then you add some texture with Lincoln Lawyer, who, this is a character who comes, who thinks he's in... Thank you. Thank you. Who thinks he's in control of his situation, and it sort of spirals out of control, and then you find out what he's made of. But in terms of pivot, to go from rom-com to NC-17, to, I mean, this guy is a stone cold killer. So I'm interested, number one, why you thought he, you could play him, and then why you thought he could play him. Mm -hmm. You um, seem nice. You seem friendly, nice? except in this movie. Who, You're Joe scary as hell. Is no, it, Joe is scary. Is who nice? You are nice. Oh, I am nice. Yeah, you're Cape. Joe is Cape very nice. Actually. He's courtly, he's mannered, but he's, he's pervy and he does kill people. Yes. <laughs> Coldly. So there's, so there's that. Emotionless, emotionally less, yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, first thing, when I read the script, and I've said this before, I did not get it. I did not like <laughs> the world. I didn't like how it, it smelled, felt. I didn't, I didn't get it. I didn't even allow myself to get it. Or if I did get it, I didn't like it. I remember throwing the script in the trash and going, I don't want to be a part of that. And I, like I said, I wanted to grab a steel brush and take a long, hot shower. Right. Um, and then um, I, I, re I gave myself a couple of days to, to, to flush that out. And I, I reread it after I'd been turned on by someone whose opinion I trust about the funny bone that's in it. Um, right. And as I reread it, I did find myself chuckling, then laughing, and then belly laughing. And that was when I understood who Joe was. Right. And I didn't have the answers for him, but I said, you know what, I, I, I see a way to really love this character and get underneath. I don't know how I'm going to get there, but there's a way to the other side now. Um, a lot of that was understanding Tracy's writing. Tracy lets us, the meter of his writing was very different. And once I understood the rhythms of his writing, and then the work for then, from then on for me was now you have to commit to those rhythms. And what do those odd rhythms reveal? And what do they not reveal? Um, this was a real exercise for me about introversion. Um, everything with Joe is underneath, at least for the first two. Yeah, hours. everybody in the movie is screaming except you. Joe is very deliberate, very much a perfectionist, very clear about uh, rules of engagement, very clear about consequences if those rules are not followed. And um, structure and order is what this guy has in, in his life. And what he needs, another thing that helped me a lot, was what is he looking for? What does he need? And that's, that's family. So he kidnaps this one, or at least a yeah, part. He, goes, he, he does go from uh, cohabitation to inhabitation. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Friedkin, what made you think uh, it, that uh, Matthew would be the guy to play Killer Joe? I actually saw Matthew on a television interview. I forget whether it was Larry King or Charlie Rose or someone like that. And I saw Matthew on this interview program as himself. And of course, when you're thinking about the kind of a character <coughs> that you described, you would think about one of these uh, grizzly bear type guys to play Joe. You know, a rough hewn, sort of a very, um, overt um, villain. And I saw Matthew in this interview being himself and extremely charming. And I thought, no, this would be a better way to go for this character. He's the kind of a guy that can charm the mustard off a hot dog. Right. And uh, I felt that, you know, I started to think about a new way to present this character. <coughs> and because I know people like this, to be honest with you. And they're not heavies. They're very charming guys. In fact, one of them babysit my son when he was three years old. And so I knew these characters and their charm. And uh, so I, we sent the script to Matthew, and you heard his reaction when he first saw it. He didn't think it was for him. Gina, the, the, the character you play is arguably this, probably the smartest or one of the smartest, you know, characters in the movie. She knows the score. 
She's kind of movie. She knows the game within the game. So that's an interesting and textured character. Then again, when when uh, the director spoke with you about it, it's like, uh, you know, it's going to open. You're not going to have any pants on when 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 the movie opens, and then people are going to. Um, uh, th this family is going to gradually turn on e turn on itself and do horrible, unspeakable uh, things to each other. Did you think to yourself that sounds like fun? Or <laughs> <laughs> I'm in. No, actually, um, I. That's not how he described it to me. And also, I. I knew about this play because it had been presented to me years before right. as an off-Broadway show. And I remember reading you it. You used to run a theater company, yes? Yeah, I'm a part of Naked Angels that's okay, still right, running. Okay, right, right. Um, and I remember reading it thinking, wow, what interesting characters. This guy can really write. And oh, I love this character. And as I kept going on and on and getting to certain scenes toward the end, I thought, <coughs> oof, I can't do this. I don't want to do this eight times a week. Just because, right. you know, in order to make these characters work, they're real and they're deep and they're complicated. And I just thought, I ain't going there eight times a week for six months in a row. These are very traumatic human in interactions that I, they have. I just think it's psychologically a rough part to play for that right. long, right. you know. And um, so I didn't, and it always bothered me. It's, one of the, it's really probably the only part that I was interested in that I thought, I'm not going to go there. You know, I don't shy away from parts easily, but it, it really bugged me, that whole end part. And um, so when I got a call, I guess Tracy had mentioned, I guess you'd been looking at people, and Tracy Letts had said to Billy, you should see Gina for this. And so when we met, we actually never even talked about the nudity. We didn't talk about, we talked about the snakes. I, was, I just had some weird experience. You know, I was trying not to ask you about the exorcist the whole time. <coughs> we, I, I don't know. I don't even remember what we really talked about. But after a half an hour, he's like, "You know what? I think you're perfect for this." Which um, I then, did. Yeah. And then later on, you know, we discussed that. But it was never. I mean, I, I certainly was aware of it, of the character. And I think, you know, it's. Um, I think they're really Tracy. The way he writes parts. The more you read it, everything is revealed. You know, everything is um, you can understand why every character is doing what they're doing. And so everything makes sense. So, so the, movie's, the movie's shot in New Orleans, right? <clears throat> but set in Texas. Yeah, not in New Orleans itself. We had a studio in New Orleans, but we shot mostly outside, you know, outside the city. Right. Uh, but we had, we had a sound stage in New Orleans. Well, part of it is theatric, right? Part of it is... I don't think of it that way, David. But it, but let no. me let me just finish. But then it just opens into a great big movie. Movie. I mean, it really, yeah, jumps up and goes. It's a you know it, the source material is obviously brilliant, mm -hmm. and it's been time tested. Uh, but movies come from a lot of different sources. Not a lot of people know that Casablanca started as a play. Right. It's considered one of the great American films. It was a play called Everyone Comes to Rick's. And basically, all the characters are in this play, the situation, the setting, you know. It's shot on a soundstage, mostly. It was all shot, on, except for the last scene in Burbank At the airport. airport. Yeah. yeah, where they had midgets in the distance, really, to yeah. look like baggage handlers <laughs> in perspective, because the shots were so close, and they wanted people to seem like they were way in the distance. They were midgets. That's amazing. Next time you watch Casablanca, <laughs> You, you, you'll notice that. I mean, obviously, it's not what people think about when Bogart and Ingrid Bergman are on the screen, or even Claude Rains. But You've kind of ruined the whole beautiful moment now. Instead of that moment, I'm you're sorry. like, what are those midgets sorry, doing there? Spoil I'm a film buff. <laughs> That's no, but, uh, Thanks a few for good searing men. that into our skulls, yeah. Mr. Friedkin. A Few Good Men was a play. Right. Some, uh, Cabaret, yeah. a great play, you know, happened to have music in it. Uh, films come from all kinds of sources, and we've all made films that have come from many different sources. Some come from our imagination, some come from the headlines, uh, you know, some are novels. Tracy Letts actually got this story from a, a news story that he had read about a case like this uh -huh. in Florida, that had, it was this exact scenario. The, the Texas in the movie seems about right. You know, 
Matthew, you know, you know Texas pr pretty good. Um, I mean, did you, when, when you saw the finished film, this, did you think to yourself, this feels about right? It felt right, but it never, I, I, I never really thought of it as specifically Texas. I mean, there, there, there's dialogue there's, um, that is about that spot in northeast Texas, south of the Oklahoma border. Um, there's really tasty stuff that is about it, but I mean, it was a more of a, a rural area, trailer park, small outside on the outskirts of some city USA, or not even USA. Um, you know, and, and, and there's, there's, there's horror films and there's scary films like a, you know, a Scorsese film because of the, the claustrophobia. Then there's, there's fear because of something like The Shining, you know, yell as loud as you want, no one can hear you. This is closer, this area and geography is a little closer to the latter. Right. Even in a trailer park, it's a transient sort of na uh, with people. that dog Go just there. barking and a dog barks all night. Kind of uh, sun you know, is after a while, people quit yelling, "Hey, shut up!" You hear, you know, something happening, domestic violence or something next door. People in a trailer park in those areas are not going to hop up every time and go, I'm going to go see what the hell's going on. It's sort of a live and let live, do your own thing. And it, it, do people do live dual lives in those areas. Um, you can skirt on the outskirts. You are on literally on the outskirts. You are living on the fringes of society where you don't have anyone really messing in with your business. So I know for me, someone like Joe could lead a dual life like that. I saw the movie in a screening room, which is not an ideal experience because you have all this industry twits mm. sort of gathered in a room and there's no popcorn. I mean, really. <laughs> That's a... What, what, <laughs> but it, what was funny is, is people were kind of looking at each other and saying, is, is, it, <laughs> is it okay to laugh? Because you could hear kind of people stifling laughs and saying, this is about a family that loans their daughter or sister out to a stone cold killer as like you would a hamburger or something. And, um, you know, it, it's some, some very rugged, rugged stuff. And yet, it's kind of funny. <laughs> In it parts. Is it is funny. It's very fun. So, <laughs> it's hysterical. I'm hoping it's supposed to be funny. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, you made me a little nervous going quiet like that. No, no. Dr. Strange loves funny. Yeah. Right. And it's about the end of the world as, from nuclear war. Yeah. And it's hilarious. The, it's black comedy. Yeah. I don't like to define a picture, but the, this is very edgy. We're not going to fool anybody. It's out there on the edge. Uh, it got an NC-17, which is the most draconian rating they can give. <laughs> and that used to be an X. If the X was still here, this would be an X-rated picture. Because, but the, you know what? I don't agree a lot with the ratings board. But I think I'm that, stunned by that. <laughs> but, but I think this is, it's the right rating for this film. I honestly do, because we're not targeting teenagers. We, you know, we're not looking for young teenagers to, to be in the theater. Even though I feel, I think we all do, that a lot of young people are, are pretty hip today and know what's going on. But this film's not targeting them. So the NC-17 is a correct rating for this picture. One of the things Gina and I thought about when I'm watching the movie is there's something I like in every single character. I mean, um, uh, your character is up to no good, Matthew. Really, fundamentally, your character is up to no good, fundamentally. But I kind of liked them and cared about them, and so I wonder how you. I mean, the woman you were playing was extremely manipulative, and yet she was capable of a very real kind of. You know what? Let's. I, I think we have a clip of you and Juno in the in the pizza place that is mm -hmm. a good example of what I'm talking about. I had a boyfriend in third grade. I never told nobody. His name was Marshall. He was fat. He loved me. You need to go out more often. Nobody ever knew we were going together. We didn't see each other at recess. We didn't sit together at lunch. We never wrote notes and he didn't walk me home from school. Why would you see him? In class at school. I mean, alone. Oh, 
I didn't see each other alive. Ever. That would have spoiled the secret. How'd you know you're going together if you never spent any time alone? We just knew. If we talked about it, it wouldn't have been what it was, which was true. What was true? Love. We loved each other. How do you know we love you if y'all never talked about it? Because you love me with pure love. Well, not many like that around, I guess. Isn't that great? I just love that grace note at the end. There's not many ar around like that. It's uh, beautifully delivered, beautifully Thank written. You. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting. I feel like um, in movies, well, in any acting situation, you, you know, you work on it, you come prepared, you have an idea of what you want to do with your character, but then the truth is you're dealing with certain actors and you have to deal with the situation, you know, honestly. And I think originally, you know, Charlotte, she is very manipulative and she has a plan, you know, to get a better life for herself. You know, and this is, and I... Sort of what everybody's doing in this movie is trying to get, yeah, make a move. They're, they're very animalistic, very feral kind of people to me. And right. they're trying to survive the best, they way, the best way they know how. But I have to say, when I met Juno, I fell instantly in love with her, and I felt very maternal towards her. So something shifted, and I realized, you know, I'm, Charlotte's actually trying to help her out, get her out of this toxic environment, give her a chance to have a better life than I had been having. So it, I think that was just because of Juno's specialness that it, it, it added that kind of human quality to Charlotte. So nobody in this movie is all good or uh, all bad. Who is? No one is in real life, I don't think, you know? You can't judge people. I think even the craziest people, bad people, there's some reason, you know, crazy or not, that they have for doing what they do. And I think as actors, I mean, I know for me, that's what makes me attracted to people who are a little bit, you know, if we wanted to judge them, dodgy. But there's no such thing as a bad person. I really don't believe that, you know, when you're playing them. That's not their intention to be bad. They, they have a reason. Well, this the the movie is about a real family, right? It, I, I mean, the, the, in their own way, they love each other, except the mom, who you never seen, and they're all plotting to kill her. Well, the mom, other than that, the mom tried to kill the daughter. Yeah. Right. Juno Temple's character, but all of the people in this story are trapped by their own dreams. You mm. know. Mm -hmm. they, and they can't escape their reality, but they're, they're trying to. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a very human situation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I personally don't believe in, in a character that's all good or all evil. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think if you're an actor and you're playing Hitler, mm -hmm. you have to find Hitler in yourself. You can't pass judgment on him while you're playing him. Well, you're a director, so it's easy to find the fascist within. I'm just kidding. And it, easy to find what? The fa it, 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 most, most direct, directing is like being a dictator, yes? No, not at all. And they'll tell you that. No, they'll tell you. May, may I tell you what directing is? I'll, I'll try and Please give you. Please do. I'll try and give you. You did, you did direct The Exorcist and French Connection, so. Jesus, that's right. <laughs> I, I struggled to get through the conversation backstage without going all quaky and fanboy about those movies. Listen, I, I here, what a direct, the most important thing a film director does is choose the material that he or she wants to make. <clears throat> the next most important thing is to find the ideal cast, which is, in this case, was a gift from the movie God to me. And the third and most important thing, once that's done, is to create an atmosphere on the set where these actors who are well cast and the crew who are also well cast can feel free to create, can, can feel that they're not being judged, that, they, that I want them to bring immediacy and um, and I'm not looking for perfection. I'm looking for spontaneity from them. And that's about 85% of directing, 
It really is. The rest is putting it together. And you could mess it up in the editing room, but once they deliver performances like this, in material like this, you, you know, you've accomplished 85 to 90 percent of what the work of a film director is. Matthew, I'm interested in what you learned from working with the great William Friedkin. Well, to simplify it, like he just did, those three things are very important, and he makes it sound simple, and it does, that is how it went down. Um, the atmosphere was there for the work. We didn't have time to really step out and think of anything else. Um, enthusiasm for the material, enthusiasm for the day, for the scene, for the, the people that you're directing and the characters that you're directing. Um, a specificity about it, about, I mean, I had one of the best, the best hour, most clear hour with a director before we even started the film, when Billy and I sat down, uh, right when I came on board. It was just, it was one hour. And I think of everything that was said, and usually the information that I got out in that hour would usually take about five to six hours to get out, because it was very clear. It wasn't pre-planned, but it was very clear why he wanted me, what the movie was about, precise vision of it. And that's when I was like, okay, that world in this man's hands, I would like to go be this guy, Joe. Um, also, <clears throat> if it's the confidence to, uh, if it's going well, if, if, you, if, if, if the scene's working, if you're nailing it, don't, just keep it that simple. It's great when it's set to move and move on. We got it. One take is a great thing. We did get two sometimes, but I... The camera was out of focus or something. <laughs> it had to be way out of well, focus. Well, way so, out of focus. But, but I, I, I'll say this. It was, um, you know, when I heard, and you were telling me we, do, we, we move quick, and, you know, first take's what I've used the most in my, in my past, as you said. Um, you said in your past you used the first takes, most no matter how many takes you did. That was a very daunting and, and intimidating um, <laughs> hypothesis for me going into it. But once we were shooting, it immediately became, oh, well, F it. You got nothing to lose. Yeah. If you get one, mm -hmm. huh, well, lay it all out there now because it, so actually it became, it, it became incredibly freeing to say, well, you get one, so don't hold anything back and then get your head out of the way because now's the time to do it. And again, our conversations, I know mine with Billy, were short and sweet, and you'd maybe a little bit of this, and just before you could even finish your sentence or I could do mine, we'd be going, now show me, let's not even talk about it, go do it. Right. And that's, I know for me, it was a real thrill mm. to go to set and not be sitting there, let's all sit down and work out the scene. No, let's do it. Let's record it now. We did have those rehearsals on Saturdays down there to sort of choreograph the general. Just choreography. A little choreography, and you would say, who are you, where are you, what's your relationship to, you know, this time and place and people, but basically that was made us as actors much more comfortable because it was just a, we understood the, at least the sandbox we were playing in and sort of what the what our what our sort of whatever regulations are where we had as far as space even. Mm -hmm. um, but then when we were there, it was uh, let it rip. Plus, plus uh, Tracy, who wrote the play and wrote the movie, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He he like did a big like big long thinker a long memo for you guys too yes he sent me a, an eight page single spaced memo about what he felt about this material that he created and I shared that with the actors I sent them all a copy of it <coughs> and it's you know it's great to have that mm. it was you not only have what he wrote but you have how he felt about what he wrote. And, and my attitude is I, I'm really there to fulfill what the writer has created. I, I, I came more and more to that from having started to direct operas. And when you direct an opera by Verdi or Puccini or Strauss or the greats, Wagner, uh, you don't change a note or a word of the libretto. I mean, it's been good for 150 years. You know, and so why would you change it? And, and this was true of Letts' script. It was just spot on, no? And you felt yourselves in the characters. And, but the, the courage that comes from wanting to go to these dark places, I really admire. I've never been an actor. Uh, you know, I couldn't do what they do. I, have, I wouldn't even know how to begin. It, it, it is a great inherent skill. I don't believe it can be taught. I really don't. I think certain rudimentary principles are taught, and there's some ideas 
that make some sense, like use, it, use of sense memory, mm. you know? In the right if you have to play anger or joy or uh, terror, whatever it is, you have to reach back into when you as a person actually <coughs> experienced those things in order to put them on screen with your character. And that's a great skill that's taken for granted when you see a good movie. Okay, Gina, your character um, takes the character played by Thomas Hayden Church. Uh, what's his name? The Ansel. Okay, Ansel, down to the basement. And what's, what's about to happen is Juno is going to be turned over to Killer Joe, right? Mm hmm And you're trying to get him to s sort of, you know what, it's better to just run the clip and then you can tell me what, okay. what was going on. Could you roll the second clip before I tell that girl, it's just gonna be her and Joe. She'll figure it out. You gotta tell her. That girl's not like other people, damn it. She don't put two and two together like you, me, and Chris. What are you so worried about? She's never been on a date before. It ain't a date. Well, it's the closest thing she ever come to one. Except for some fat kid, didn't even know it. What fat kid? You talk to that girl, else you're liable to blow this whole thing real good. What am I supposed to say? Tell her the story, for God's sake. Why do you have to make everything so difficult? What story? The situation. Tell her why Joe is coming over tonight. How am I supposed to get if to she that? She don't know what's expected of her. She might disappoint him. I'm riding her over to the thrifty, ain't I? So you got him, you got Emile Hirsch, you got Matthew McConaughey. Pretty good bunch, right? Yeah, it's pretty, uh, it's very fortunate. How many days were you shooting the movie? How many days? It was 22, something like that. 22, something like that. 22. That was too long. <laughs> Listen, you know, we, as, we, as Matthew was saying, we, we were lucky, you know, um, if we had two takes ever. And sometimes, so thank God, we didn't get two takes. It's like, you got it? Great, because we're moving on. No, I don't own best. stock in Eastman Kodak, <laughs> okay. you know, and so there's no reason to do another take. The attitude they bring to the set is we're ready. Yeah. We're ready, let's do it. This take, when you say roll it, and everybody who w is working on the scene is there to do it right, including the guy who's holding the camera, which isn't easy. He's there to do it. It's not a rehearsal. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. It's called a take. And it, it's like, uh, that take sh is it, you know? Not, I used to, when I started directing films, I used to do 32 takes like, like everyone else, you know, hoping for a miracle on about take 29. <laughs> and then I'd get it into the cutting room, and there were no miracles. Usually the first printed take had the spontaneity. Yeah. And after, you know, uh, quite a long time, I figured it out. It's the first printed take. It had the spontaneity. But Billy also, is, he cast it so incredibly well. You're going and doing a scene with really good actors. So you've got to bring your A game and you've got to be ready. And when you have good people, you don't have to sit there. And we had the script, so it's not like we're trying to find what yeah. works. You come in prepared and you just play. And that's, that is a rare thing. But, I haven't but encountered that. But as, as actors, do you like that? Hit it and quit it? Like, that's it? We're I, moving on? Well, Ideally, if that's, but that doesn't always happen. Yeah. Like I said, if, 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 if you were confused or didn't understand the text or what the scene was about or you messed up the first one, with this script, with Tracy's script, it was usually because you didn't quite get, you yeah. don't have a hand on what he wrote yet. Right. There are many times, and I've been on many films, where that's not the case. You mm -mm. need to pine it out right there and work it out and flush it. And you're looking around at everyone, everyone's going, <laughs> Yeah. Let's try this, man. Yeah. And, and it's because it it, out. the identity was not so clear mm -hmm. on the page. Um, I've been a part of those. Mm -hmm. yeah. And sometimes you find it, sometimes you get away with it, um, sometimes you don't. <laughs> this was that clear that if it, if it wasn't working, there's a fundamental obvious reason. You look on the page and go, are you not understanding mm -hmm. this? It's there for a reason. 
We didn't really rehearse much either. Mm -mm. I, I don't believe in rehearsal either. He did staging as it was yeah, kind of free. Choreography. Like, these are long scenes that, as actors in a movie. I'm not used to doing that long of a take. So as long as you knew where you were going, then you were free. Then you just play the scene, and we got to really go yeah. through it. And it built momentum. It felt a, much more organic than a normal scene where you're like, you know, cut here, cut there, cut there, and. It just had a flow. I'm, you, I, I'm an actor. I'll give you, the, if you want those 32 takes, I'll yeah. ask for the 33rd. Yeah, I know. I'll be a workhorse yeah. to the end of the day. But there's also a, a fact when you know you have one or two, there's that extra, there's 10% of courage that you don't tap into going, no, it's live. And it's once now that if I know we can go 30, I might ease on into number seven. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right, you know? exactly. Warm and up. <laughs> no, you got one. It's no. Let's get the head's not in it. Get after it. I once yeah. visited the set of a of a film that Francis Coppola directed, who's a I might say proudly as a good friend. Mm. And I watched an actor do some takes in this movie that Francis was directing, and it would go something like this. Hello, how are you? Hello, how are you? <laughs> Hello. How are you? <laughs> no, I'm serious. And this is a very well-known actor who gave about. every possible reading while the other actor was standing along, waiting for him to finish. You know, and how many ways can you say, hello, how are you? Try a it lot. Sometimes, a lot. <laughs> Apparently. You know, but uh, I was going for something else, spontaneity. That's what this film needed. I think it's what it has. Uh, you know, this is the best ensemble cast I've ever had in a picture. And that is a gift of the movie God often. Because I've had films that I have miscast. Uh, nothing to do with the actor, just my judgment. This one I didn't miscast. Um, I'm, I'm terrified I'm going to get through our, our talk and not show the clips, because I think the clips are really good. So I'm going to keep motoring through this. In this scene, it's you and Emil Hirsch, and um, it's time to sort of get to getting people have discussed this crime, mm -hmm. and um, um, they decide it, it, it's going to be done. Will you will you roll the clip at the amusement park, and we can talk about that? You want me off the job? Say the word. When are you planning on doing it? Tonight. Really. So you'd be leaving tomorrow, then? No, no, no. The retainers for the money. I'm not leaving until I get my money. I don't like that. Oh, I don't care. I don't want you near my sister. I don't care. And if I tell you the deal's off? Then I'll leave right now, and you'll never see me again. Your call. So you're the man in black in this. You're like the, <laughs> the, 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 the bad guy throughout. You play a pretty good bad guy, I got to say. Thank you. Like, um, you seemed uh, uh, capable of doing almost anything. And by the end of the movie, you sort of proved your character, of course. Uh, um, do you think uh, in, in playing someone that dark, you have to find the darkness in your own self or just find it in, in the material? Well, I mean, to a, <laughs> to a, to a, to a very uh, obvious but fun extent. It is, you know, people always ask the question, what's more fun, the good guy or the bad guy? And there's a reason that the bad guy is really fun, because you do get to go do some things that outside of, the set in the film, you'd, you'd be sent away to the pen for. And it's all free. And when you get to do it in, in, in a film. So, and, it's, and the bad guy gets to make up his own rules. Now, Joe's rules were very, were very clear. Most of it, though, it, it's coming from the material. I didn't have to personally go, oh, I want to tap into that side of me that could be a, a, a hired hitman on the side. Jo Joe, as you see there, there's no emotion involved with this decision that you need Zero. to make, young man. And as he does here, which he does later in the film, he puts the truth in the asker's kitchen. I, I don't care. Shit, 
or get off the pot. Right. You're wasting my time. Do you want me employed to fulfill this job <laughs> or do you not? I don't care. Mm. It's you start business. to sweat when you're it's, saying it's, that. It's, it's so it's it's <laughs> it's emotionless. I mean, and Joe is very much a uh, a cold businessman like that. What makes it horrifying is we're talking about murder, and this kid's talking about, hey, my sister, this. I I, I don't care. <laughs> but do you want me to finish the job or not? You tell me. If you if it's no, then you'll never see me again. That sort of prag prag practicality. I think the pragmatism of the guy is part of what's really kind of horrifying about him. Um, it's very straight. The rules were set up clearly at the beginning. The consequences of not following the rules were set up as well. One of the things I wondered about, and it's just, it, it's a weird, like, period on my part. D did you think of, do you think he was good at his day job? Like, was Joe? he? Yeah. He, yeah was he, at, he was great at it. Oh, yeah. Joe's a perfectionist. He, he was yeah. great at it. Structure but did he, order. But what I was thinking was he, when he was a cop, did he play it straight? And that he just happened to kill people for money when he was, like, off the clock. I think he was right by the book as a cop. I think people probably thought he was in the in the in the police department or whatever in the Dallas PD, whatever. They probably thought he was a, uh, you know, a, a, a nice enough gentleman guy. But they did never had long conversations with him. He said good morning in the morning, and they invited him to go have drinks after work, and he never quite made it. Right. He was always there on time. And how are you? They asked him a question, he was probably, uh, you know, very sort of obtuse or just didn't have much to say. He's not a guy who's there to reveal himself, not a guy who outside of this job is out to make friends. He's not there to get along with anyone. Right. And uh, I think the, I've met a lot of police officers in a number of uh, cities, and I think the very best cops that I've met are ones who think like the criminal. I think that's why they're effective. There's a very thin line between the policeman and the criminal. Mm -hmm. That's one of the themes that attracts me to this film, that thin line mm -hmm. that the guy, you know, could cross. And we all know of stories of some officers who were very distinguished who went bad, who went over the line. They're so close to it all the time, you know. And the cops who were most effective that I saw knew the criminal mind. One of the things that I think of when I think of the characters is deal with the lighter. Yeah. Opening and closing the lighter. It seemed like sound played a very prominent role in this film. It opens on sound, it, 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 and it returns and loops back to sound. Or maybe you always make movies that way and I never noticed. Uh, oh. the, the biggest influence on my work was dramatic radio of the 1940s, which was the, the most powerful medium I've ever encountered because it called on your imagination. <laughs> you had only sound, not just sound effects, but voices and great music mm -hmm. to set a mood without a picture, no pictures. When I was listening to dramatic radio in Chicago, you know, there was no television, but it was good enough. And this lighter thing, th that's one of the things that wasn't in the script. I saw Matthew sitting over by the side of the uh, set, fooling around with this cigarette lighter. And I started to think it's a sound metaphor for this guy. It's a little bit of a, of a habit that he's picked up in character that defines the guy. And so much later on in the editing room, I decided to open the film with the sound of this cigarette lighter and then the sound of someone in boots walking, which to me has a kind of um, fear factor about it. Some stranger is coming to the door. And uh, I, so we invented a soundscape that begins the film. Uh, and you hear what sounds like uh, a, a rifle or a shotgun going off <coughs> after you hear the trigger being cocked. And then you see that it's not a rifle or a shotgun, it's thunder and mm -hmm. lightning. So I'm always um, trying to create a soundscape. I, I view the soundtrack of the films I've directed as completely different from the pictures. And very often, the entire soundtrack is done afterwards. The whole track. 
Yeah, well, this sort of brings <clears throat> up the point about why I'm merely a vessel for the material I'm presented with, and I just convey it. I mean, no, it's still true, David. But I mean, I'm okay. looking for ways to. By the way, there it. was no script for French Connections. So That's true. I, okay, there's that. So. Well, there were, yeah, but there was a great script for. <laughs> The birthday party by Harold Pinter that I did, and the boys. Right, another in the band. play you shot. Yeah, uh, boys in the band was a great script. The Exorcist is a great script. I mean. And the sound though is what makes it so scary in The Exorcist. I mean, when you have the rat sounds before you mm -hmm. talk about the rats, it is. It really creates this tension that you're nervous even before you know what's happening. It's so brilliant. Sound is a great tool. Yeah. And it, it isn't often used to its full. It's often used just to illustrate what you see. Mm. And I like it when it uh, enhances or adds something that you don't see. Mm -hmm. this, this movie's also got a chase scene in it, too, which I, it's nice to see you be run, running one of those again. It's I mean, a little chase. It's, 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 it's nothing epic. It's pretty scary, epic. though. It's nothing <laughs> epic. Well, I mean, we did it in an afternoon because I thought it'd be fun. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, you know, the French Connection chase took about, I don't know, five or six weekends. Uh, and uh, the one in To Live and Die, about the same. This, this we shot in an afternoon. You know. I just wanted to have a little fun in the film. You Should know. we all blame you when a movie's motoring along and all of a sudden there's a gratuitous and horrible car chase right in the middle? No, the, car, the chase is always a metaphor for one of the characters. The chase in The French Connection is a metaphor for the obsession uh, of this cop, you know? And, and the very greatest chase scenes ever made, most of them by Buster Keaton, by the way, are all a metaphor for the character. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not just a guy. I mean, I've seen some films where there's a chase scene, the guy looks like he's, you know, going to lunch. And, <laughs> and then there are scenes where that metaphor is very strong. I have to tell you, I saw all the Buster Keaton chase scenes after I, I filmed the three chase scenes that I filmed. If I had seen them before, I would have been landlocked. Because you can't top. The, the, the chase scenes that Buster Keaton did in films like The General and Steamboat Bill and uh, Seven Chances, uh, they're just amazing. They, they make everything that I've done really look like an exercise. I, I heartily advise people who want to see, and the chase, by the way, <coughs> is pure cinema. It's something that can't be done on a canvas. It can't be done in a book. It can't be done on the stage. It can only be done on the screen. It's pure cinema. Do you think that, uh, I, I want to talk about Juno for a second. She's, mm. she's not a kid, right? She's, she's how, 21. OK. And uh, Gina brought up The Exorcist, so in, in which, you know, as an example of you working with another young actress and bringing extraordinary things. That, uh, is, does it make any difference how old somebody is when you work with them? Yeah. I mean, she did a great job for you in this movie. What makes all the difference, no matter how old they are, is intelligence. The first thing I look for in an actor, and what I found in Linda Blair in The Exorcist at the age of 11, was a profound intelligence. She understood the material. And that, that's what you have to work for and uh, uh, with. And if, if Linda Bla we can't try to cast thousands of 12-year-old girls to the point where I thought we were starting to audition 16 <coughs> and 17-year-old women who looked younger. And I thought, we can't make this film. And one day, Linda Blair came in. Her mother brought her in unannounced and without an appointment. And she, uh, she was with an agency that represented children and they sent us about 12 other little girls, but not Linda. <laughs> and I was thinking of casting two or three other fine young actresses for that part. And Juno Temple sent me uh, an audition tape that she had done with her 10-year-old brother playing Joe. <laughs> Whoa! Yeah. And uh, I was an, about to make a deal with an actress, and I saw this tape. And I, it was sent to my casting director, and she said, you might want to look at this. 
And, w and I love my casting director. She's really good. I looked at it, and that was the girl. So I said, to the, I said, okay, that's it. School's out. Let's hire her. We hired her. She came to my house to meet with me, and she's got this thick British accent. <laughs> I, what the hell is this? <laughs> you know? But her, her Texas accent was, was good. good. Yeah, well. I, Matthew and uh, Thomas Hayden Church are from that area, and I asked them to keep an ear on, on Juno's Texas accent and to tell her, not even bother to tell me, but to tell her if there's anything off, and it was spot on, and she just did it. And, you know, you talk to her. She was up here. She's got a very thick English accent. Yeah. Almost cockney. Very proper, though. Yeah, but yeah. sort of proper, but not exactly. <laughs> uh, but, you know, there's a lot of people who think she's 12 years old in this film, which is a big mistake, because there's a beautiful line in a seduction scene she has with Matthew in which he says to her, how old are you now? And she says, 12. And he says, so am I. And it's, she's referring to her first mm -hmm. crush that she had on a, a boy that was probably never fulfilled. And there are people who've written about this movie that say, this, he gets off with a 12-year-old girl. And it's very clear that she's not a 12-year-old girl. The, you, you've, you've done very well, Matthew, and I, I think you're really good at, 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 at Showing how humans uh, come to care care about each other, how they come to uh, uh, love each other. You've had a, a great career um, establishing connection with other humans. This movie had that too. I mm -hmm. mean, it's it's mm -hmm. it's it's December, May, or whatever it is. But I mean, you you have a dinner scene with her, and it, yes, <laughs> you're eating tuna casserole yeah. in in a trailer house. But what's afoot is romance of a sort. Yep. yep. So how'd you pull that off? Well, the character she plays, Dottie and Joe, she's very much an outcast as well. Right. Um, she doesn't really fit in, not even with the family. You know, to what level is she clairvoyant or what have you? I, I don't know. But where Joe and her, for my money, where they came together, it's not like they came together like, ah, oh, True love, they the two people finally found each other. There are two people that live in this little sort of, I don't know, purgatory of a black <coughs> void in society where they really don't, they don't fit in with anyone else. And they happen to look up and go, oh, you're here too. I didn't know anyone else, anyone else was here. They're not speaking on the exact same level, but that's where they find themselves. There's two sort of loners, outcasts, misfits that, have, that are in this little void in, in in society, and that's where I think they sort of say, oh, you're of me and I'm of you. Well, let's spend some more time together. Um, and innocence was a big thing. Mm -hmm. That she was, that is, I don't know when the last time Joe had that in his life. You right. know, the only, and for my money, I, <laughs> the only female relationships or interaction that Joe had before this were five minute quickies on the side of the highway. Right. You know, with who says, you know, who yeah. knows. Um, again, that kind of goes back to family. And again, this was something very pure, something for someone very innocent, someone who Joe didn't have to explain himself, but still got to sort of scare her. And she loved to be scared by Joe's stories. <laughs> he was telling them for the first time. And she made this tuna casserole. I mean, there's nothing better in the world at that moment than a tuna casserole made by you. Right. Uh, and so it was you very, it was, clear, it was yeah. the first time. And, and, and the scene that we have together is very much like two, two virgins coming to get together. It, it, was, it was very, very delicate. And then our dinner scene, yeah, it was, it was, it was you know, I remember just going, the Joe would be setting the scene mm -hmm. here. We're going to take, we're, we're, and, and then you know what? Let's, I remember this, don't rush dinner because I don't want this to end. Right. Light the candle. Eat. Can I get you anything? It was so. That was um, very much a child, in Joe. But that's who he, he he saw. She was purity. She was innocence. Well, you got the feeling he didn't have a lot of nice dinners. That that he didn't come up. 
Uh, yeah, I don't. That his house at mealtime, because he's such a freak about, it. now let's say grace, now mm -hmm. let's, I, I mean, it was like he was trying to recreate a world he never lived in. Well, again, as a, as a guy who maneuvers and his incentive is about everything has to be in order and structure, the basic, I mean, he gets destructive because he needs to put things back in order. Mm -hmm. right. And he's seeing this family that is out of order, even to the extent of he might have, I don't know, do you ever think that Joe was thinking about, and you hired me to do this? I don't, I don't know if he ever, if that's where he was Never occurred from. to me, Matthew. You know, but, but he was, uh, that, that could have been another despicable yeah. thing that he was just. Uh, oh, yeah. I think he know. had a certain, has a certain contempt yeah. for the people who hire him to go to the dark side. Right. But just a sec, think, the family actually had second thoughts. I mean, Emile's character was like, yeah, uh, no, don't eat. Well, yeah. Well, people get nervous when they get that close to the fire. I think our last clip is the trailer for the movie. We're going to go 30 seconds long. We're going to watch, then we're going to quit. Will you roll the, uh, the trailer? I need $6,000 or some guys are going to kill me. I better get out of town quick. You ever hear of Joe Cooper? He's a cop, a detective, actually. He got a little business on the side. What you do? He kills people. Mom's got a $50,000 life insurance policy. Killer Joe's a professional. He'll do this right. This murder we're talking about. I ain't agreed to nothing. I heard y'all talking about killing Mama. I think it's a good idea. Well, there you go. My payment is $25,000 in cash. No exceptions. That's not our problem. What is your problem? We have a problem with the advance. No exceptions. The conversation is finished. Of course, we never discussed the possibility of a retainer. What do you mean? Hey, man, you talking about my sister? Is that who she is? She'll figure it out. You're liable to blow this whole thing real good. Who you into for this money? What'd he say he'd do to you if you don't pay him? I'm gonna wrap you up electrician tape and bury you in a coffin about 10 feet deep. And if I tell you the deal's off? You'll never see me again. Do it. Tuna casserole. May I serve? How are you gonna come, my mama? That's not appropriate dinner conversation, Donnie. Dad. Who told you about Killer Joe? Oh, my God. Were you going to get a cut of this money? What are you getting at? <laughs> Who's that? Joe, listen, we got to stop this. A toast to my future wife. My sister never did nothing to nobody. I can't let you have her. The retainer is for the money. I'm not leaving until I get my money. You know I'll kill you. Smells heavenly. Who would like to say grace? I've never seen a red bar. Yeah, it's good. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much.